The remainder for this discussion tonight is going to be well worth it, because tonight we have a special talk arranged for by the Watchtower Bible Entity. The title of the talk tonight is, Who is Your God? And since the answer to this question involves our happiness, we need an accurate answer, and the only way to get that answer is by using the scriptures. So everyone's invited to take out his personal copy of the Bible and to use it as this information is discussed. But tonight, Brother J.R. Brown, a traveling elder of the Watchtower Society, is going to enjoy this discussion with us. And so we'll listen to Brother Brown then as he discusses who is your God, Brother Brown. Most people who believe in God think this question too easy to give serious consideration to. Because if you were to ask a believer in God, who is your God? Well, they feel it could be very easily answered by them presenting their own personal viewpoint. In fact, in an audience such as this, the answer would most likely be, well, the God of the Bible. That's my God, and if one knew his name, Jehovah, then he would add that to it. But now, can the question be dismissed with so little consideration? That is, one just giving his own personal viewpoint as to who he says God is. For example, what does the God you claim to be yours say about you as a worshiper? Does he acknowledge you as one of his servants? Does he accept you as a worshiper of his? If not, even though he may be God, he is not your God. So the question is not just a matter of your personal viewpoint, and it can't be dismissed as easily as saying, well, my God is the God of the Bible. His name is Jehovah. It must also take into consideration what this God of the Bible, Jehovah, thinks about you as a worshiper and whether you are acceptable to him as one of his servants. Also, there are other factors that need to be considered. For example, if you believe in the God of the Bible, can you establish his existence? Many today say that an unseen God cannot be established as actually existing. So it means if you claim the God of the Bible as your God, then you accept the responsibility to give valid proof that he exists to any who might call this in question. So obvious, it takes a little thought. It takes a little examining of the scriptures to really get an accurate answer to this question. Also, something else is noted about many people who claim the God of the Bible to be their God, and that's this, that they have such a hazy conception as to who God is, and they know so little about Him that actually they cannot really claim the God of the Bible as their own because their little knowledge, their partial information makes them worshipers of a God who really doesn't exist. The true God of the Bible having revealed so much more about Him than they've taken the time to come to know about. Is that true of you? Is your understanding of the God you claim to worship so hazy, so distorted, so little, that in actuality you could not be considered a worshiper of His as one who is known by you? Well now, besides person claiming to worship a living being as God, that is the God of the Bible, Jehovah. We know that many people today worship things. For example, there are many who will outright admit money is their God. Others will tell us mine is pleasure. Some take science as a God. Others have taken their governments or ideals or philosophies and so forth. But now here's the question that we raise concerning all of these things that people worship today, and that is this. Could there be some living being behind the worship of all these things that accepts the worship that they're offering to the various things today? Well, the answer to that is yes, unequivocally yes, because the Bible makes very clear that though many claim to worship things, there is a living being, a God, behind these things that accepts the worship they offer through these things. You know who it is. It's the devil. His name is Satan, and he claims the worship of all those who worship various things today. 
Well, now we've come to a basic conclusion in determining the answer to our question, who is your God? Because the choice is only between two. That is, the God of the Bible, Jehovah, or his enemy, and the God who accepts all of the other worship that people offer, and that is Satan the devil. That's true. There's no need to discuss hundreds or thousands of different gods, because basically and scripturally, there are only two. The God of the Bible, Jehovah, his enemy, Satan the devil. So when we ask, who is your God, we mean, who are you worshiping between the two of these, or more important, which one accepts what you're doing? Which one accepts the life you're living? Which one accepts the doctrines and teachings that you believe? That's your God, even though a person may give an opinion differently. Well, now, doesn't that make this question even more important? Who is your God? Isn't it then vital that we determine who is accepting what we're doing so that we can know accurately, scripturally, and assuredly that uh, our worship is directed to the one whom we wish it to be directed to, and that is the God of the Bible, Jehovah. Well, now, some persons criticize us for taking this position. They say Jehovah's Witnesses are too strict to say they're just two gods, and you mean if I'm not worshiping the God of the Bible, Jehovah, I'm worshiping the devil? That's hard for some people to accept or to digest. But now, it's scriptural. Jesus Christ took that position. For example, now, using your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 7. And here we find one of Jesus' better known illustrations. And it concerned religious roads and religious travelers. And it pointed out their destination and who accepted exactly what they were doing in the way of worship. On chapter 7 of Matthew, look there at verse number 13 and then 14. Now Jesus says, Go in through the narrow gate, because broad and spacious is the road leading off into destruction. Many are the ones going in through it. Whereas, narrow is the gate, and cramp the road, leading off into life, and few are the ones finding it. Now, how many roads did he mention? He said there was the single road that was broad and spacious. It led to destruction. It was broad because... A person could do whatever he wanted. He could worship things or idols or what have you, but any way he wanted to do, he was doing on that road, but it led him to destruction. His God was the devil in spite of any personal opinion he offered. The only alternative, Jesus said, was the cramped road. How did you get on it? Well, he said you had to squeeze through a narrow gate. You ever done that? You may have to get sideways and scoot through, but you made it. But then he says, you're on a cramped road. You ever been on such a road? How many ways can you go? Only the way that road goes. If you deviate from that, then you're no longer on that cramped road. So Jesus used these religious roads to illustrate that one was traveling either one or the other. Take yourself right now. You're traveling either that broad road to destruction, or you're traveling that cramped road that leads to life. And the answer isn't merely your personal opinion. The answer is who you're pleasing, who's accepting what you're doing, who believes the way you believe. And that's why it is vital that we honestly and truthfully see what determines the road that we're traveling. Well, we made a point a moment ago that if you claim you're traveling that cramp road, your God is Jehovah, that you should be able to prove he actually exists. Have you heard this question raised of late by persons? How can we be sure an unseen God actually exists? Well, now, what do you say? What evidence do you offer? If he is your God, then you can prove he's there. How is this handled? Well, you handle it like you prove anything else you can't see. You have to take evidence. They're seen to us, but we establish their existence through evidence. For example, let's say it wasn't night, as it is now, Let's say it was bright, sunny daylight, like we had just earlier. In front of our kingdom hall was a blind man, and you asked this question of him. Can you give any evidence, Mr. Blind Man, that the sun actually exists? 
could he do it? Or would he disbelieve it? Although he may be who are sighted persons, he certainly could give ample evidence to prove that sun was there. Well, now likewise, that's how we prove anything else unseen actually exists. We take evidence around us that testifies to its actual existence. Now notice how in the first chapter of Romans, we're told to use our reasoning power in order to establish God's existence. Then you'll see there how he helps us to do this also. Romans chapter 1, now do you see verse 19? I'll read it, then verse 20. Because what may be known about God is manifest among them. For God made it manifest to them. For his invisible qualities are clearly seen from the world's creation on them, because they are perceived by the things made, even his eternal power and Godship, so that they are inexcusable. Well, now, is this true? It says God has made it manifest to us the things we need to know, the things we can look at to tell that he has eternal power, Godship, and that he actually exists and is superior to anything man-made or that we know about. Well, we all know there's ample evidence. We need not spend much time with this. Well, you take the earth itself, the miracle of growth, tiny seeds put in the ground, then later there's delicious food to eat, or beautiful flowers that blossom. And of course, when we compare this with the power man has, we see there's really no comparison. Men have been unable to produce the very simplest form of microscopic life. And that includes all of his laboratories around the world. Then too, when it comes to the things that we see as a result of growth, men can't do them. He can't make a single blade of grass in all of his laboratories around the world. And even if he made that blade of grass, is that what he wants to eat? Or does he want delicious food? pleasing to the eye, palatable to the tongue. Well, we know the answer. So this establishes God's superiority, someone higher than man that must supply these needs. We can look at man's body. Look at the marvelous systems. The doctors and scientists say they're not unrelated. They say every system in our body is related to the other. The circulatory system, the nervous system, the blood system, the digestive system. If one breaks down or falls down, the others will rally to its side to try to make that body work anyway. Who thought of that, man? Not even his doctors understand it fully. One more example should be good, and that concerns water. That's our most essential fluid. Do you know it has a remarkable characteristics that show the remarkable and the eternal power of our God, Jehovah? Well, maybe you do, maybe you do not. Have you noticed this? Water, when frozen, expands. It gets bigger. As a result, it's lighter and floats. You know that because when you put an ice cube in your Pepsi, it doesn't sink to the bottom, it floats right there on the top. And you know, too, that it expands because when you fill your ice tray, you don't go all the way to the top, you leave a little room because you know when you pull it out of the freezer, it's going to take up that extra space. So, because water, when frozen, expands and gets lighter and floats, it keeps all of us from living right here on this earth in a refrigerator. Did you know that? How so? Well, now, consider this for a moment there, how it's saving the whole world of mankind. Let's say just the opposite were true. Let's say water, when frozen, was like most other substances. They contract, get smaller. That's like that chicken in your freezer. When you pull it out, it has shriveled up a little. It has gotten smaller. See, that's how most things do when they freeze, not water. Well, that's saving us. Let's say water did like most substances, and uh, when frozen, uh, became more dense, and instead of floating, would sink. Well, during a cold winter, what would happen? All the water on top would freeze. Lakes, rivers, ponds, all around the world. And since it wouldn't float, it would uh, become more dense. It would sink right to the bottom. Well, now, there ice would be all winter. Then when the summer came, the sun couldn't penetrate all the way through the water down to the bottom where the ice was and melted. So by the time winter came around again, you still have much ice at the bottom of all the rivers and lakes and streams. 
But then with winter, that on top would freeze again and float piling up on top of that other ice. Can you see what would happen? Now, after a few winters, there wouldn't be a drop of water on this earth. All of it would be frozen and we would be in a refrigerator, except we wouldn't be here. Because without our most essential fluid that God provides, then we could not exist as men. Well now, who thought of that? Who thought of making water the exception to most substances? Not man. He appreciates it. We live as a result of it, but it establishes the eternal power of Jehovah God. And therefore, that evidence around us collectively makes very clear He exists. We could go on and on and on, showing all around us, ourselves and everything, proving that the God of the Bible, Jehovah, is actually there. Why? No wonder. That verse we read say, it is inexcusable for someone to look at all this evidence and then to say, there is no God of the Bible. No, there's ample evidence and Jehovah exists. He's worthy of our worship. He deserves it. He merits it. And that's why we want to make sure that we're never pleasing his enemy, Satan the devil. He's real too. Not a fabulous character. He wasn't made up. He wasn't invented in the minds of some people. But he actually exists. And his whole goal is to divert worship away from the true God, Jehovah. And when he succeeds in doing that, then that worship becomes his own. And then the devil becomes one's God, whether he acknowledges it verbally or not. Well, it would behoove us now then to examine a few attitudes and practices common today. Things that people think that by doing or believing they're pleasing the God of the Bible. And in actuality, they're pleasing God's enemy, the devil. And the devil becomes their God by virtue of accepting what they're doing. Well, one example, common attitude, we see people today uh, having in religious matters. And that is that interfaith is a good thing. Now, interfaith or ecumenism is worship based on the idea that all religions are good. You heard people say that? Go to the church of your choice. In fact, many people feel there's no such thing as a false religion. And when you speak of a false religion, they feel, well, something must be wrong with you. Because they feel all religions good. And so they'll visit various churches and they hope, well, maybe they could all get together someday. They may even be in and out the kingdom hall some weeks. And another week at church because they feel, well, long as it's anything about the Lord, that it must be good. Will that work? That I be acceptable to Jehovah God, the God of the Bible? Not at all. It doesn't please Him. There's good evidence to prove it. For example... One conversation that Jesus had uh, destroyed the validity of this idea. And he was talking with a woman of another religion. She was a Samaritan. Well, you remember them. And they believed in this much of the Bible. The first five books that Moses wrote. Well, now suppose Jesus asked this Samaritan woman, Who is your God? What would she say? Well, Jehovah, because that's all Moses wrote about. But you see, she didn't believe in the last 34 books of the Hebrew Scriptures. She believed, as all other Samaritans, only in the first five. Well now, she claimed Jehovah as her God. What would Jesus tell her? Well, look in John chapter 4, and we'll pick up this conversation. And notice how Jesus explained things to her and to help us get a right understanding of this idea of inner faith or ecumenism. John chapter 4, now starting at verse number 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our forefathers worshipped in this mountain. You people say that in Jerusalem is the place where persons ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you people worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, because salvation originates with the Jews. Nevertheless, the hour is coming, and it is now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father with spirit and truth. For indeed, the Father is looking for such like ones to worship Him. 
God is a spirit. And those worshiping Him must worship Him with spirit and truth. Now, did you notice what Jesus told her? Jesus said, you worship what you do not know. How could He tell her that when the woman said her God was Jehovah, the God of Moses, and she believed in that law, and Jesus told her, you worship what you do not know. Because of this, her understanding about Jehovah God was partial, incomplete, distorted, only based on five books of the Bible. God had made known much more about Himself. So that little bit that she used to try to worship Jehovah God was unacceptable. In fact, the God she worshipped actually did not exist because there was no such God with just that little information about Him being in evidence. So therefore, Jesus could say, you worship what you do not know. And then He said, in contrast, we worship what we know. We worship a God known to us, the truth. And that's why he said God's looking for such like ones who will worship him with truth and spirit. She was not, even though she made the claim that her God was the God of the Bible, Jehovah. Well, now, she's like many people today. They have a Bible. They claim to worship the God of the Bible. But they are worshiping what they do not know because they have so little understanding. They have such little information, and it's distorted and incomplete, that the God they're rendering worship to actually doesn't exist. A non-existent God. So in effect, that worship goes to Satan, the devil. He accepts all worship not based on truth, and they would be travelers to that broad road that led to destruction. Well, now, doesn't this tell us something quite clearly here? Doesn't it make clear in our minds that we've got to worship a God known by us? Merely to attach ourselves to a name, Jehovah, and say our God is the God of the Bible, is not enough. It means He must be known to us in an accurate, true, and clear way. Otherwise, we could become just like that woman, a worshiper, of a God unknown to us. And many today are like that, and thus they make clear that their God is actually the devil because of not worshiping God in truth. There's another practice that we should mention now that's common. You've noticed it more and more lately, and that is the emphasis on astrology. Even church people are involved. You notice now, as soon as you get around some people, on the job or elsewhere, the First thing they want to know, when were you born? Then they want to look it up on the chart, see what kind of person you are, get a reading on you. <laughs> they want to know, well, can I get along with you? And we'll check things out on their astrological charts and uh, see just where you stand. And they feel such is acceptable. It's not uh, spoken out against in most of Christendom's churches. Well, now this faces us with a problem. Who is that pleasing? Where did it start? It started where all false religions started in Babylon. Here's the origin. The Babylonians believed that the stars, the planets, moon above us, and that part above they call the zodiac, were the home of gods. They believed that God lived on each of the suns, moon, or planet. And as these gods moved their homes about, then they influenced the people living here on the earth. So that if you were assiduous and you kept up with the movement of the stars, and planets, and sun, and so forth, that you could tell how these gods would be influencing your future. That's where it started in Babylon. Well now, what did God think of it back then? Well, we can read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 18, because true worshipers existed then, and He warned them about it. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse number 10. Now notice what it tells us there. There should not be found in you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, anyone who employs divination, a practicer of magic, or anyone who looks for omens. Did you notice that expression? Anyone who employs divination? 
Now that's when a person tries to obtain knowledge about unknown things, either from the demons or by looking for omens. You notice that expression too. Look for omens or signs, such as through the stars, which would tell them what the future was going to be. Well, now that 12th verse, it makes a clear statement. For anybody doing these things is something detestable to Jehovah. And on account of these detestable things, Jehovah your God is driving them away from before you. So then, it's clear, anyone who looks for omens by means of the stars or astrology is detestable to Jehovah God. Even though you may see them in church every Sunday, even though they may claim to worship Jehovah as their God, they are detestable to Him. Now some persons will try to justify and say, well, it's just harmless fun. That's why I checked the horoscope, the astrological chart. I don't mean anything by it. It's not harmless fun. Because you see, the reason people started looking to stars in the first place was because they felt they were the home of God. If they had not felt that way, they would never have started looking to those stars. So that a person today, whether they acknowledge it or not, they're looking to false worship, and their God becomes the leader of the demons, Satan the devil, who is one of the wicked spirit forces in heavenly places, influencing people to do what is wrong and worship distorted from the true God, Jehovah. Astrology is a practice the Bible condemns, and it would be something to totally shun in all of its various forms and aspects. There's one other attitude that's common today that we'd like to bring up, and you've noticed this too, and it concerns the matter of morals. People have been taught today you can take moral liberties as long as you don't hurt anyone. And if you ask a person, well, is fornication wrong, including adultery, or homosexuality wrong? They'll say, well, it depends on the circumstances. Even their church leaders have said, uh, it may not be wrong. If you're not hurting anyone, then it's all right. Or they say, you really better love the person. You really better mean it. And then if that's the case, if it is a meaningful relationship, and if you are not hurting anyone, they say, well... It's all right. They call that situational ethics. They won't come out and call fornication wrong. In all of its various aspects, they'll say it depends on the situation. They like to call it a new morality. But it's not new. It's just an old way of people trying to get their own way about sex, to be able to indulge in sex life with whomever they wish, wherever they can. The Bible speaks against this. For example, I'd like you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and see if you notice anything vague about this matter of fornication. See if after reading this you're confused about what the true God, Jehovah, would require of His servants. See if you're puzzled or perplexed. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to read several verses from verse number 3. For well, this is what God wills, the sanctifying of you, that you abstain from fornication. Each one of you should know how to get possession of his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in covetous sexual appetite, such as also those nations have which do not know God, that no one go to the point of harming and encroach upon the rights of his brother in this matter, because Jehovah is one who exacts punishment for all these things, just as we told you beforehand and also gave you a thorough witness. For God called us not with allowance for uncleanness, but in connection with sanctification. So then, the man that shows disregard is disregarding not man, but God, who puts His Holy Spirit in you. Now, are you confused as to what to do about fornication after reading this? Does it sound like a situation could come up that would make it acceptable? I said right there, abstain from fornication. That means keep away from it altogether. That means if you are a single person, 
you are not having sex relations with anyone. It means if you are a married person, then you are having sex relations with one person, and that's your legal mate. That's all the Bible permits. Anything other than that, of course, is outside of the Bible's moral requirements. That's why he said there, each one ought to know how to get possession of his own vessel. That's your body. And each one ought to know how to control it to the limits that the true God places on it. Now, here's the reasoning behind it. Your vessel, your body, as one of Jehovah God's servants, is dedicated to Him. You attach yourself to God, and that means you disown yourself. Your body is not yours. Now, a person then that goes out and commits fornication, whose property has he misused? God's property. Now, will Jehovah God permit that? No, it says he exacts punishment for a servant of his that would misuse his property. And that's why those who serve Jehovah God, they keep their bodies clean and free of fornication. And no matter how many preachers or clergymen or others say that a situation could exist that would make this acceptable, those who are traveling that cramped road, you can only go one way, are following this, and thus they are able to please Jehovah God. Well, now I think we've established the principle. We can reach a conclusion. Not just what we think about doing. It's not a matter of what pleases us. It's not a matter of the way we feel about something when it comes to saying, Jehovah is my God. But it is a matter of actually pleasing Him. If you look at Psalm 15... You'll see this principle enunciated in a simpler way. It first raises a question in Psalm 15, and then it'll answer it. See the first verse there? It says, O Jehovah, who will be a guest in your tent? Who will reside in your holy mountain? He who is walking faultlessly and practicing righteousness and speaking the truth in his heart. Now, that makes very clear. Is your God? Is it Jehovah? Then, of course, it means you are walking faultlessly, practicing righteousness, and speaking the truth in your heart. You see, Jehovah determines who will be a guest in his tent, in his great spiritual temple, in which he's calling people today to worship him acceptably, in the courtyards of here in this earth. So we could take this principle and apply to any practice or attitude that would come up. If it is practicing what is righteous in God's eyes, and it's truthful, and it's faultless, then of course it is acceptable to God. Otherwise, it places one on that broad road, and the only God that could accept it is the only other God that in reality exists, and that is Satan the devil. Well, now, this should move us from our hearts to really want to know this God that we're serving, to have a complete understanding of Him as much as He has revealed to us, to do all we can to keep learning more and more about Him. Are you doing that? For example, many people know what Jehovah is not. For example, they know He is not a trinity three-in-one God, as the churches teach. Or they know he is not a torturer of sinners that made a hell fire and fiendishly stands over persons being tortured in it. Or they know, for example, that he is not responsible for wickedness. But now, did you notice all those are negatives? In other words, just understanding what God is not, or just clearing up the reproach, and confusion that the false god, Satan the devil, has brought on his name doesn't mean that you know who he is. You must consider the positive side when we talk about who is your God. What do you really know about God, his qualities, and appreciating these in depth? For example, do you fully appreciate that Jehovah is an awe-inspiring God of love? You've heard the Bible make both those statements. But now how deep is that in your heart? 
To what extent have you used the Scriptures, His works, His dealings with mankind, to build up in your heart a grand appreciation for Jehovah as an awe-inspiring God of love? Well, it takes understanding how God makes Himself known to us. We can't understand Him in spirit terms. It's true, God's a spirit. But now we don't understand spirit terms. If someone explained God to us in spirit terms, well, it would be just like you trying to explain to a blind man what the color red looked like. Now, he's never seen any color. Now, what would you tell him if you were trying to tell him what red look like? Well, you could fumble around, but you'd never be able to explain. Well, it's like, uh, it's a warm like color, and it's, uh, well, like a rose. Well, you haven't seen a rose. See, you couldn't really get anywhere. You could not convey the idea of color to a mind that has never seen it. Well, that's like if an angel tried to explain to us Jehovah God in spirit terms and say he's awe-inspiring, we wouldn't get anything out of it. And that's why the Bible explains God in human terms. It takes things around us that we know. And it says, this is like something about God. But now what we're to get out of that, if that what is described is great and even inspires awe or fear, then what would the true God, Jehovah, in reality be like? Let's take an example. Look in Daniel chapter 7. It's a well-known vision. Jehovah God saw that Daniel had this, and he wrote it down. We can use it to enlarge our appreciation that Jehovah is an awe-inspiring God. Daniel 7, now verse 9 and 10. See what impression you get from the reading of this verse. Daniel 7, 9. I kept on beholding until there were thrones placed and the Ancient of Days, that's Jehovah, sat down. His clothing was white, just like snow. And the hair of his head was like clean wool. His throne was flames of fire. Its wheels were a burning fire. There was a stream of fire flowing, going out from before him. There were a thousand thousands that kept ministering to him, and 10,000 times 10,000 that kept standing right before him. The court took its seat, and there were books that were open. You could see that, didn't it? It said, the Ancient of Days, the true God, his clothing was white like snow. God doesn't wear any clothes. We do. But now what is it telling us? Well, if we could see that clothing white as snow, we know what an outstanding appearance. Hair like clean, fine wool. Well, we can see that and how resplendent it is. And then it tells us thereafter that there are the thrones and fire shooting all around. And if we saw that scene right here, what would it do to us? It would inspire us with awe, maybe even fear. Well, now, if that's the way a scene is that explains God in human terms, can you see how truly awe-inspiring the true God Jehovah actually is? And how much he is to be reverent, feared. He's not a plaything like some young people take him for today. And even older people who feel that they can do things and try to serve him anyway after claiming to be one of his servants. No, but the true God is actually to inspire awe and reverence in the hearts of his servants. In 1 Peter the third chapter, a related point is mentioned that builds this up in our minds too. That's chapter 3 in 1 Peter. Now in verse 12, notice a few more human terms used to tell us about the true God. For the eyes of Jehovah are upon the righteous one, and his ears are toward their supplication. But the face of Jehovah is against those doing bad things. Notice how it spoke of God as having eyes ears, a face. No, he doesn't. We have our ears and a face. But now it's letting us know some things in particular. For example, it said Jehovah's eyes. That means he has sight, but nothing like ours. If we cut out all the lights in the hall now, how much would we see? Not a thing. Our sight depends on light. If there's no light, but instead darkness, we see nothing. Not Jehovah God. His sight does not depend on light. 
In fact, he can right now look down into the heart of anyone sitting here. He knows whose mind is on this meeting and serving him, who is truly seeking to please him, and he knows whose heart is somewhere else on something of this system of things, or who's getting bored with his worship, or who is chafing under the true worship today that is being made known from his great tent or spiritual temple there. You see, his vision does not depend upon light to make it known. It spoke there too of the ears of Jehovah, that's hearing. We depend on sound waves to carry it to our ear. If sound waves do not bring the sound, we hear nothing. Not Jehovah God. He can hear a prayer in your heart, unuttered, where there's no vocal sound. He has done it in Scripture and answered it in an instant of time. Well, now, doesn't that build appreciation of awe, reverence for someone like that? So the fact that human terms are used to explain who Jehovah God is is to help us build up the proper respect, reverence, and fear in our hearts for Him. We said He's a God of love. You've read in the Bible. How deeply do you appreciate Him? In itself, it's just a statement. But now, if we use our minds to reflect on God's love, we can gain quite a bit from it. Did you know this? There was a time in this vast universe when there wasn't a single person except Jehovah. He was all alone. Now, he wasn't unhappy. He wasn't crying. He didn't need anyone else. He is totally complete in himself. And if he were selfish, it would be that way today. Because you see, a selfish person wants to have it all for themselves. They're not willing to share. But not our God. He's decided that he would first create a son. We knew him later as Jesus Christ. And then, with this son, he decided, I'm going to share everything else. In fact, he told his son, we're going to make many other heavenly creatures, and I'm not going to make a single one without you. But now, did he tell his son this, and then say, but now don't let any of them know about it. Because if they know you help me as a partner, well, they'll give you a little honor, and I want it all for myself? No. He let every creation in heaven know this son is also responsible for your creation. Now, what were the results? Well, that those creatures gave the son some honor. Jehovah wasn't uh, fearful of competition, he wasn't jealous. He wasn't stingy or selfish. God is love. And then after he made all those spirit creatures in heaven, then he decided he'd father a human race. And he and his son put the first man and woman here. Well, we know what happened. They didn't appreciate Jehovah God. They sinned. What did he do then? Did he turn his back on the human family? That's how a lot of human fathers do, don't they? When things get difficult at home. They leave the wife, children, everybody... And sometimes go on off and start another whole family. Selfish. Just interested in themselves. Not Jehovah God. When he saw his earthly prospective children in trouble and that they could be ransomed, then he decided to do so. Who did he send? Did he pick out the least creature in heaven and feel, well now, this one is expendable. I can spare him and send him to the earth to ransom mankind? He could have. But instead, he took the one closest to him. One who he loved very much and that would touch him uh, to lose and send him to this earth. And he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And he came and suffered and died and offered his life as a ransom to please the Father. That's love. That's not selfishness. That's putting oneself out for others. That's the kind of qualities that our God has. And of course... Since Christ has ransomed himself, he's continued to wait patiently to give people a chance to benefit from this ransom. Many people to this day, because of God's love, are blaming him for the troubles and wickedness and distress. But in actuality, it is because of his love that he has permitted wickedness to exist to our day to give you and me and others time to repent, straighten out, and get in line to serve him. But now who has suffered because of this? Jehovah God. The reproach is on His name. People aren't blaming the devil who's causing all the trouble, violence, and wickedness. The average person is blaming God 
and saying either he doesn't exist, or if he does exist, he must be bad, or he must be impotent and powerless to do anything about this situation. Who's suffering all that reproach, Jehovah God? Does he have to? No, he does it because God is love. That's our God, Jehovah, the one worthy of being worshipped. Yes, we can see knowing God means knowing these things about him. Being positive and seeing he's awe-inspired, a God of love. He has standards, too. And it's obvious that he does have standards for his creatures when it comes to morals, when it comes to the way they should behave and conduct. Doesn't everything around us teach that Jehovah's a God of standards? For example, look at our cycle of day and night. It's constant. 24-hour cycle we have day and night. We never get up wondering, how long will the daylight be? Or how long will night be? We can depend on it. And we see gravity. It always, when something falls, it goes down. We can see how it's uh, consistent in metals in the earth. If something is to be hard, every time man finds it is hard. If it's to be soft, it's always soft. If it's to stretch, have elasticity, then it stretches. Every river on this earth runs down. There's not a single one running up or off to the side. Well, now that shows he has standards. He has a set standard for these physical things, and it means when it comes to serving him, he has a standard too. Do you know what it is? That is the basic one. Well, we can read it in 1 John chapter 5, and at verse number 3, here's the standard for those who want him as their God. 1 John 5, 3. It says, For this is what the love of God means, that we observe His commandments. And yet, His commandments are not burdensome. Well, now see the standard? Simply stated, it's obedience. Anyone who says that they love God would have to be one obeying Him. Because to claim to love God and not obey His standards would mean that one in actuality didn't love God. But now some might say, well, now it said there, and yet his commandments are not burdensome. Some might say, I think it's a burden. I'd like to serve Jehovah God, become one of his worshipers, but it's too strict. I like his promises, and I like what is said, but isn't it a burden? Look what I'd have to give up. Look what I couldn't do. That's why I think it's a burden. That's the very reason I'm not serving Him or I am not serving Him fully and acceptably. Do you think that way? Well, the first thing we should find out from someone who does, what is it that you want to do? Now, when it comes to things that are right, there's no restriction. For example, you want to be a loving person? Well, Jehovah God lets you be as loving as you can. You can do all in your power. As far as you can go humanly, you can be loving. You want to be a merciful person? You can show as much mercy as you can. You want to be generous? You can be as generous as you can. You see, when it comes to doing good and right, there's no limit. There's no restriction. But now, when does Jehovah God place a limit? When somebody wants to do something hateful, when they want to do something like the devil, when they want to do something that's evil, then naturally he's going to make a law and prohibit them from doing that. When they want to go get somebody else's wife or husband, well, shouldn't he limit that? When they want to sell somebody's youngster's drugs, when they want to sneak in your house and take out what you have, well, shouldn't there be laws against what is indecent and what works harm out? So God's commandments are not a burden. In fact, if you have a righteous heart and you love what is right and you want to copy Jehovah God in being loving, then you have all of the freedom that you can have. But it is only when it comes to what is wrong and what works against one's neighbor and what is harmful that Jehovah God places a limit, and rightly so. And those who love Him, they want to become like Him. They want to copy Him in his unselfishness, in his love, in his generosity, in his mercy, and they can do all that within what is humanly possible for them to do. So, appreciating that God has standards is part of knowing Him. He has a purpose, too. He's going to accomplish it in our day. His purpose, and that is His primary one in our day, 
is to clear up his name. The reproach that has been brought on it, clear it, and remove from the earth all of those on that broad road. Remember, it said it led to destruction, which means they'll have to be destroyed, and that is, they'll be destroyed by Jehovah God, and along with them, their God, Satan the devil. And this is so those who served him can live on a paradise earth that he makes. They can live in peace and unity always. Well, now, isn't that a wonderful promise? It's so wonderful. You see Jehovah's Witnesses preaching about it. They're going house to house. They're conducting Bible studies. That's why you see them. Because they see God's purpose about to be fulfilled, and unselfishly, they want all persons who desire to come to know their God and to serve Him. In fact, if you desire to be in that paradise that Jehovah God is making, if you desire to be here when He clears His name and removes those who are worshiping the devil, then that is a work that you ought to be doing today. That is, preaching the good news of Jehovah God's kingdom, which will sanctify and vindicate His name. Because it's only those who are doing that work and complying with His standard of obedience in that regard and in regard to living a proper life in harmony with His will that He will usher into that new system of things that He's making. Imagine, soon all wickedness removed from the earth. Only worshippers of the true God here. And then He's going to start to do many things. He's going to end poverty. He's going to bring the dead back. He's going to feed them. He's going to make them delightfully happy. You want to read a description? Well, look in Isaiah chapter 26. And this talks about, well, several years from today, when happiness has been restored to this earth by Jehovah God. And notice what His worshipers there are praising Him about. Isaiah chapter 25 now look there for verse number 6. Reading starts, And Jehovah of armies will certainly make for all the peoples in this mountain a banquet of well-oiled dishes, a banquet of wine kept on the dregs, of well-oiled dishes filled with marrow, of wine kept on the dregs, filtered. And in this mountain he will certainly swallow up the face of the envelopment that is enveloping over all the peoples, and the woven work that is interwoven upon all the nations. He will actually swallow up death forever, and the Lord Jehovah will certainly wipe the tears from all faces, and the reproach of His people He will take away from all the earth, for Jehovah Himself has spoken it. And in that day, one will certainly say, Look, this is our God. We have hoped in Him, and He will save us. This is Jehovah. We have hoped in Him. Let us be joyful and rejoice in the salvation by Him. Wasn't that wonderful, the graphic picture there? Of the end to all the problems that face mankind. The welcoming of dead loved ones back, and the rejoicing. No wonder those worshippers of Jehovah God exclaimed, This is our God. We have hoped in Him. Well, now the question is, Is He your God? Well, take your opinion, and obviously hearing about Him, it's yes. But then keep in mind, it is a matter of God's accepting you as a worshiper. And whether you are meeting the standards that He has set for those serving Him. But have in mind, as you make your choice for Jehovah to be your God, that there are only two sides. And that's Jehovah's side or his enemy, Satan the devil. You are now on one or the other. And it is a matter of who you're pleasing in your everyday life and in your conduct. And if you are pleasing this true God, Jehovah, and if you have joined with those worshipers of his today, then the joys that we just read will be yours. And they'll be yours eternally to enjoy with all the other praisers of the only true God, Jehovah.